Hello. I'd like to welcome everyone to this evening's event. My name is Georgia Court. I am the proprietor of bookstore number one in Sarasota, Florida. And I'd like to offer a special welcome, by the way, to our friends from Miami's Books and Books who are joining us this evening for this presentation. What we're doing, because we expect a fairly large crowd, is to keep you all muted, so sorry about that. Uh, and we're going to ask you to go ahead and put your questions in the chat. And when the presentation is over, then we will go to the questions that you have submitted. So we can go ahead and get started with introductions. Meg Lohman, a Sarasota native who's also known as Canopy Meg, is an American biologist, educator, ecologist, writer, editor, and public speaker. Based right here in Sarasota, she's the executive director of the Tree Foundation and a professor at the National University of Singapore, Arizona State University, and University Sans Malaysia. Nicknamed the real life Lorax by National Geographic and Einstein of the treetops by the Wall Street Journal, Dr. Lohman pioneered the science of canopy ecology. Her motto is no child left indoors. She travels extensively for research, outreach and speaking engagements for audiences both large and small and virtual as we are tonight. And her new book, The Arbor Nut, A Life Discovering the Eighth Continent in the Trees Above Us was just published today. So this is the launch. And you can purchase that book either at Bookstore One Sarasota, and if you go to our website, you'll find out how, or at Books and Books. So whatever you do, please support your local independent bookstore. Tonight, Dr. Lohman is joined by her son, James Burgess. James is a biotech entrepreneur and founder and senior executive at Finch Therapeutics, a company developing innovative microbiome-based medicines for serious unmet medical needs. Beyond his work in the microbiome field, James is a passionate steward and supporter of the natural world and believes working as a summer camp counselor at a nature camp in West Virginia was the best job he'll ever have. He lives with his wife and his nine month old daughter who we've just seen and is just as cute as she can be in the Boston area. And they enjoy hiking and camping in the forests and mountains of New England. So, so outdoorsmen all, please welcome uh, Meg Lohman and James Burgess. Thank you, Georgia. Well, I'll just turn it over to James. It's nice to have a son that can be in charge and ask the questions. So go for it, James. Oh, he's on mute, I think, Georgia. Mute. Oh, I don't know if somebody can get him unmuted. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. I was just um, put myself on mute because we have a very chatty baby who we'll briefly introduce and then she'll probably pass up. Here's so this my is Lila. Granddaughter. <laughs> and um, she, she'll be uh, the center of some of our questions for, uh, for uh, Dr. Meg Lauman tonight. And so I uh, wanted her to say hello before we uh, get into the, um, uh, the crux of things here, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> perfect. It's perfect. The next generation is where it counts. Exactly. So um, <laughs> I think he's headed off. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you to Georgia and the uh, uh, Bookstore One for hosting the event. And we're excited, um, Mom, uh, Meg Lauman, to uh, be able to learn more about you and, and the book that you've written uh, here. And so I think... Um, you know, I have a couple questions that we'll we'll start with, and we you know we can hopefully um, get into a little bit of a discussion with those. And then I think 
as we do, uh, you know, we'll keep an eye out for questions from the audience that we can start to bring in uh, on the back end um, towards the, the, the back half of the hour. Um, but maybe just to, to get things started, um, Mom, uh, maybe you can just um, tell us a little bit. And, you know, for those who haven't yet seen, I actually am very pleased we just got our copies today, uh, just out on the press of the Arbonaut. And uh, maybe you could start and just tell us, you know, what inspired you to write this book? Um, you know, you've, you've had a couple other, you know, fantastic books in the past. And I think, you know, if you can tell us about the message of, of the Arbonaut and, and really, you know, what, what, you're, um, uh, what you're, you're trying to share and communicate with all of us uh, in this book, it would be uh, great to, to kick things off with that. Oh my gosh. Okay, James, thanks a lot. Anyway, I think for me, the book is an opportunity to share um, some important things to me um, and my passions. Number one, I was a geek kid at age three. I love trees and nature. And so I spent a lifetime doing that. And it just reminds me that it's an important aspect of the planet. And if I can engage other girls or even boys like my own two sons to get involved with nature, I think it's really great. Uh, but I have written a couple other books that relate to my science of field biology and canopy science. And yet this one was trying to tell the stories of how a woman in science survives and overcomes hurdles. And hopefully at the end, what are the solutions that we might need? Because saving forests right now is a really critical issue. So that meant a lot to me. But if I had one hope for the book, it would be that girls as well as boys might learn from my own misadventures as I call them, and maybe do a little bit better in their own career. Because I think I had my share of kind of hurdles and faux pas and things along the way that maybe I could have done better at. And hopefully the book will share those in a good way. So that's my hope and purpose. And I'm really grateful to the team at McMillan for Ostras and Giroux. Um, honestly, I, a village can save a forest, but it takes a village to publish a book. I had no idea all these amazing people, literary agents and my editor and all these great people in PR and marketing that have really helped bring this book to life. So it's just been an amazing experience and I thank all of them with my heart. Great. Um, well, maybe I can ask a question actually that you touched on. Um, you know, you, you mentioned that you're uh, part of what you're trying to do with the book is, is have a message to, um, to young girls uh, thinking about a career in science. And I know, you know, for those of us that have uh, know your career and your work. I think that's been a, a really important um, uh, message that you've had in in for in so many different ways and, and throughout your career. Um, but you know, now I have a we have a young nine month old daughter, and I I'd like to ask you know what would your message to uh, my daughter Lila and other young girls you know thinking about a career in science? What would your message to them be, and and what would you you know encourage them to? think about or perhaps, you know, avoid, um, you know, what would your advice to, to a young girl going into science be today? All right, I will answer that. But before I do, I just want to say that I was so blessed to be one of the first people to go into forest canopies and find millions of species. And my son James went into microbiome research where he finds trillions of species. So someday you will be having to advise young scientist James about how in the heck you do all this stuff inside of people's bodies. But that's a whole nother topic and um, you can do that in a different book someday. <laughs> um, for me, I guess, cause at age three, I loved nature and I was kind of the geek in my school. A lot of the girls, did much more sophisticated things like manicures and curled their hair and had sleepovers and I wanted to go bird watching and nobody else did. So I realized that I was probably out on a limb from a limb, young age, no pun intended. So it makes me realize that if you're shy and you're a bit geeky, that it's pretty hard to get a place that's comfortable. And so I think for women in general, that's been a problem for me throughout a lot of my career where there were mostly men in the boardroom and mostly men on expeditions and definitely men heading up universities and department chairs and etc. So I think it's a time where women's IQ and intellect and 
smarts can come to the fore. So my hope is that we can move beyond um, some of the roles that maybe were perhaps comfortable in my generation and get people like your baby Lila to think big and do well and do great. And um, I always tell girls, you know, there's two things I think you should do, you know, try to aim for. And one is support each other. And the other is to really think big and go forward. Cause I think that was a scary thing for me at the time. And also there weren't too many women supporters or women in the room. So um, the book hopefully will be an inspiration for them if they can take my little bits of advice and hopefully do better in their own lives. Yeah, that's great. Um, you, you know, I think in some ways you could, you're a, a role model to a lot of um, uh, you know young women and in, going into science. Who 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 were your role models when you were starting your career, and who are your role models today as well? Uh, you know, how do you think about your um, uh, your inspiration for, for your work. Oh my gosh, this is amazing. But do you know, I never had a woman science teacher in any part of my education, which is pretty crazy. Uh, so that in itself made me go and look at women who were deceased because I would take biographies out of the library. But I was totally enamored by Rachel Carson because she was this amazing lady that took on a lot of incredible corporations that made pesticides. And she had figured out that pesticides kill birds. And she realized that was, you know, a very big threat to the ecosystems throughout the continent. And so she was willing to do that and wrote a fabulous book or two about it. So I always admired her courage. And my other role model was an African-American, Harriet Tubman, who of all things, you know, took the slaves north through the Underground Railway. And what I loved about her especially is she used moss on the north sides of the tree to actually figure her way through the woods in the dark. And as a kid, I thought she was the coolest naturalist I'd ever thought could be because fancy, you know, going in the forest at night and navigating your way. So she was a pretty amazing lady. So those two women were my role models as a young person. And then along the way, I've of course had fabulous for good fortune to meet some wonderful people like Jane Goodall, who uh, gave a cover review of my book and is definitely a role model. And some of the women authors these days, Diane Ackerman and Barbara Kingsolver, there's some great women authors about natural history. And even your wife, Meg, and my son, Eddie's wife, Ellen, I'm just amazingly proud of watching women who do things and take on you know, responsibilities for the planet. And I think that's a really great thing. But honestly, as a kid, I, my role models were the trees. So that's pretty crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, you know, that's a good segue. The, in the book, you know, each chapter is um, kind of thematically oriented around a, di a different kind of tree. Um, and, you know, they're all important trees in their own right in different you know, um, ecosystems and perhaps in your, in your life. But, um, you know, if, if you had to pick, you know, what's your, what's your favorite tree? What's, what's the top tree out there of all of these and, and why, and what, you know, what's the story behind it? Such a hard question, you know, I know it's, the top, it's like, we'll, we're, we'll save to the end of this, who's your preferred child, but we won't, we'll keep that at, you know, at the end of the, the interview and, and that'll be the teaser to keep everyone engaged until the very end. So uh, exactly. we'll start with favorite tree. Um, so, and to be honest, my favorite tree by far is the fig, which I do talk about in the chapter called the glass canopy, which is equivalent to the glass ceiling. And I guess the reason for that is a couple of things. Figs are found in almost every tropical part of the world. There are a lot of figs, hundreds and hundreds of species. They're a really um, sacred tree in places like India and Asia, which is very cool. And, you know, every village has a tree, a big fig tree, and they worship under it and they get married under it and they baptize under it, which is fantastic. But for me as a biologist, 
figs also start life at the top. The, the fig bird poops, you'll love that James because of your microbiome work, um, onto the branch and the canopy and the fig seed germinates at the top and sends its little roots down to the forest floor. So I kind of use that as an analogy for what I wished I'd done with my life, which is be more strategic as a female and say, how do you get to the top? What are those aspects of life that would help you get to the top? And I don't think women in my generation had a lot of coaching about that. But I think looking at the fig as a role model in some funny sense gives you a sense of, you know, seek sunlight and be this nurturing species that's predominant everywhere and has such a big influence. And so, yeah, I love figs and they're delicious. So it's a good thing. And so many things eat figs. So if we yeah. have to save one tree, we better save the figs. I, I think that's a, that, that's a great answer. And I, I, I wanna share a, a small anecdote, which is that for those not aware, the, the trend these days with um, uh, grandmothers in the boomer generation is they don't like to be called grandma. Uh, they come up with these cool <laughs> hip new names. And uh, in, in fact, um, uh, my mom uh, would like to be known as Mati to Lila. And Mati is, a, a, I believe, a Samoan word for fig tree. Uh, so I think that's a very uh, appropriate uh, naming choice. Um, and uh, I know Lila is always excited to, to see her Mati uh, or fig tree uh, <laughs> grandma. So, <laughs> that's right. um, Thanks for saying that. I forgot. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so, I mean, I kind of, you know, and, and on this, you know, um, I guess, you know, theme of thinking about, you know, the next generation of scientists and, and young kids. I mean, one of the things that I'm in awe of is, I think, you know, through your career, I think, you know, balancing, uh, you know, raising two young kids and also leading a career in a, you know, field that you know was didn't make it easy to be a woman let alone probably a, a mom and and with a lot of you know complications travel to you know far flung locations you know can you share any uh, i guess you know guidance or experiences on you know how did you manage to balance you know a, a career and and parent you know parenting two kids uh you know i think you know it's it's not easy for anyone but i think especially in this field it must have been especially challenging um is there anything you know folks can learn from that experience as they're thinking about their own, you know, careers and parenting challenges. Sure. Well, I guess I was lucky. I had two pretty good kids, so I'll compliment you. <laughs> um, but a bit of logistics, which is funny, but when we took long plane flights, such as from Australia to New York, there was one gift every hour. I mean, it could be a pencil, it was wrapped up, but I had to always entertain you. And I figured, you know, as a mom, if I could keep my kids quiet from shrieking or Causing embarrassment, that was a good thing for our family. Remember we had secret codes where I would sort of pinch your elbow like twice it meant don't talk and three times it meant say thank you. We had all these fun little signals that we had to do for public behavior. But I think in general, um, for me in the long term, you know, having kids was probably a good way for me to keep my sense of wonder with my job working on natural history, which can be so depressing. A lot of forests are disappearing. One thing was great was seeing the woods through your eyes, seeing the little cool bugs through your eyes and having you discover things. So in a funny way, you guys were an asset to my career. And the other one and only thing that was really handy as a woman in science was a lot of times in developing countries when I was working with indigenous people, they would love to see pictures of my kids. They developed a sense of trust in me, maybe more than some of my male colleagues because I was female. And that was one of the few advantages I might say that helped me do good work in places like Cameroon and Ethiopia. So being a mom is not a bad thing, but it also means you have to partition your brain because you're always thinking about, you know, food and homework and laundry and all those other things. And, you know, I never really got to go out with the boys after work, like maybe some of my male colleagues did. So I did miss out on that piece of my career, but in the end game, Hopefully um, it balances out and there were more good things than bad. And uh, I'm proud of both of you that you ended up surviving your crazy mother's life. I, I was gonna say, you know, I think 
for us when we were kids, we took it for granted that we, you know, would take these trips to the Amazon or other um, rainforests uh, around the world. And I'm curious, to, you know, uh, you know, in retrospect, that must have been a little bit, uh, you know, scary to take your young kids to some of these places. Did you ever have any kind of oh shit moments when uh, you realize, maybe, you know, maybe this is, the, you know, there's some risk here and, and you were worried about, you know, anything going on with, you know, two young kids in, in the middle of the rainforest? Yes, and you are responsible. One of the worst things, one, you had an assignment in second grade in Belize to bring back a hundred things for some school science project. And of all the things, when I was up in the canopy, I came down and you proudly showed me this vial with a hundred army ants in it. Well, army ants bite like crazy. You had taken your little forceps and you'd pick these ants off of their bivouac and put them in a darn jar. And of course they could have bitten you all over and you'd be almost dead. So I was like, what, how did you do that? <laughs> so we had some funny moments. It was all good for the most part, but it was pretty funny. And I will say, you know, after I started taking you guys to the rainforest a lot, I had male colleagues write me and say, you know what, I would love to take my kids to the rainforest. Can you tell me what to pack and what to do? So in some funny way, it became a little more of the flavor of the month after people saw that I did it and you guys survived and you were still alive. And we always did take a few snacks that you liked. I, I was an addict for Oreo cookies, as you remember, and I think you had your own couple things. So one thing about traveling and eating foods in very crazy places is probably trying to think about how the kids can have some kind of sort of conventions of a few types once in a while. Absolutely. Absolutely. I always remember the Oreo cookies. <laughs> um, Sorry about that. Probably made you have cavities, right? <laughs> I'm still waiting for Nabisco to fund an expedition. If anybody's happy. <laughs> yeah, I'm maybe sure. they're not even owned, by, maybe Oreo cookies is owned by somebody else. Probably now. someone else at this point. I'm sure they're all rolled up. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to keep going, with, um, but I also want to remind and encourage folks in the audience that um, you're uh, welcome to submit questions through the chat box or, um, uh, uh, you know, as and then as we get to the back end, we will do more Q&A, but uh, feel, folks are, are welcome to, to also submit questions in the chat box as we're going. Um, I, I thought it would be... Um, you know, maybe interesting if, you know, if you can share, I mean, obviously, a, a, you know, your career has really focused on, you know, exploring the, this, um, what you call the eighth continent of, you know, biodiversity, which is the, the tops of the, the trees. And, um, you know, obviously, you, you spent a lot of time helping all of us understand how much is going on there ecologically um, in the tops of the trees, sort of just outside of our, our field of view. But I, I'd be curious to kind of get your perspectives on, on um, you know, what do you think it was about, um, you know, you and your um, kind of uh, colleagues who, who pioneered this field, you know, that was different from scientists before you for so long, it was sort of a missed opportunity. And, and do you think that was, you know, what, what kind of led to this, you know, change in um, research methods and, and, you know, on discovery of this, this new Sort of frontier, if you will, that was kind of hiding in plain sight all along, but um, but hadn't really been un unpacked until then. Yeah, hiding in plain sight is a great term, and sometimes I call it hit you over the head science because it's just really above our heads. And of course, the word arbornaut is related to astronaut. Astronauts study outer space, and arbornauts explore the tops of trees, which is a whole lot closer. But the whole idea is that it is kind of an eighth continent because nobody had ever been there before. And I find it pretty surprising. I did write in the prologue of my book and make an analogy about if you went to a doctor and they just looked at your big toe, would you feel comfortable if they gave you an assessment of your whole body's health? And I think for a hundred years or more, foresters went through forests and just looked at the forest floor and the bottoms of the trees and made assessments about the health of the forest and whether or not you know they should cut it or leave it or whether or not insects were attacking it, but they really couldn't see 95% of the tree. So the only way they saw it was to cut it down. And that meant that most of those things flew away or got squished along the journey. So I think, to find what was in the canopy was this 
again, hit you over the head science where it's not such a creative thing. It's not Einstein science, but it's just, oh my gosh, all of a sudden by developing some methods to climb, we found out that some 50% of the biodiversity on earth lives at the top of the tree. And that's pretty incredible stuff. And, um, you know, one of the cool things I have right here, my little slingshot that I don't know if you can see in my green screen, but, you know, just this simple tool that costs 10 bucks or something allowed me to put those ropes up the tree. And my counterpart, a guy named Don Perry over in Costa Rica, at the same time as I was in 1978 and 79, developing similar methods, uh, getting ropes up into trees, you know, figure that out. But we didn't have internet. We never met each other for five years until we published papers. But it was a pretty new world. It was pretty crazy. And uh, for me in particular, because I came from upstate New York and very rural surrounds where the leaves fall off the trees every winter, I was absolutely amazed in the tropical rainforest that they stayed green all year. And so to figure out what happens to these leaves and how long do they live and how do they be stay healthy i had to go up the tree according to my advisor so that was kind of what happened in fact i asked him if i could train a monkey and he said i don't think so no <laughs> monkeys lived in australia so i that's where the slingshot came in and the ropes and the harness but it was a pretty wild and crazy thing to be honest and yet it did open our eyes to all this amazing biodiversity that nobody ever knew about before and and actually i as you were walk, talking through that um did get a question from the audience to me that was you know can can you you know go a little bit further and and talk about you know what all the access methods were that that you guys used and sort of developed over the years and maybe just kind of summarize a couple of the key uh, approaches because I think they are pretty pretty fascinating for for folks to to hear about. Sure, and that there are like you know a couple of chapters that are case studies illustrating these methods, and hopefully they'll be fun for you to read. But ropes and harnesses with the simple slingshot were the first method of putting a rope over a branch and manually climbing up and getting into the canopy. But after, soon afterward, I had volunteers from Earthwatch, uh, which was very cool. That's an organization in Boston that recruits volunteers to help scientists collect data. And when you have 20 people in the canopy, you can't have one rope supporting 20 people. So I came up with this idea uh, with a few colleagues. What if we build a bridge or a canopy walkway and we could put 20 people up there at once. So the canopy walkway was a another cool method for access. And soon after that, we had the construction crane that was piloted by the Smithsonian Institution. And um, I was part of a committee that helped set those up around the world so we could have construction cranes in different forests, but they're kind of expensive and not necessarily available to most scientists. Uh, and then we had these fabulous inflatables embedded by the French uh, again, that supported an expedition of scientists and you could be in a hot air balloon or you could be on an inflatable raft and study the very top of the canopy, which you can't really do with a rope because you need a good branch and you can't really do with a canopy walkway because you need support from a big branch. So that was a pretty cool thing. And today, just to round it out, you know, we have drones and satellite imagery, things like LIDAR and some of the cool stuff that Arizona State is piloting um, to do whole forest inventories from the top down. But you still need to climb the tree to find the darn beetle that might be eating the leaves. You still need to climb the tree to identify the epiphyte so there's a lot of maybe integration of new methods and old methods to make everything work. So I hope you enjoy those chapters with different examples of using these fun, fun methods. Definitely. A, a, a nice blend of super advanced technology and, and kind of very, uh, call it, you know, low tech, but tried and true methods it sounds like which is kind of oh cool. and i forgot to add when i was pregnant i used a cherry picker because i couldn't fit into my harness <laughs> do you remember that james uh, riding uh, in a cherry picker <laughs> uh, it's a little fuzzy for me but uh, <laughs> i've seen a few pictures at least <laughs> um i think it's i think that's always really really fascinating i think to, to hear about um 
Yeah, you know, maybe you can, you know, I think talk about, um, and again, I think a lot of this you 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 talk about in the book, um, you know, again, highlighting some of the different species, but I think a lot of your, your work has been focused on, um, you know, measuring biodiversity and, and um, uh, you know, understanding the, I guess, richness and complexity of the ecosystems in the, in the, in the canopies. And, um, you know, maybe you can just share a little bit about some of the more surprising findings in, in both in terms of, you know, ecosystems and, and, you know, even specific species and maybe, you know, if there are any particular discoveries that are especially remarkable, you know, either scientifically or personally, I think it might be fun to, to talk about. Sure, I'll touch on a couple of my favorites. You know, first of all, I was interested in leaves. I'm obsessed with leaves, which sounds so boring compared to my friend Jane Goodall that studies primates, which are so interesting. But I did in the end compare, you know, tropical leaves with temperate leaves and find out that some leaves in the tropics live over 20 years, which was pretty amazing. So then I wanted to know, well, how come they didn't get eaten and how come they didn't get killed and how come they didn't dry up? So I spent a lot of years measuring all those kind of things. And one of the most fun discoveries was because I had to go to the outhouse in the middle of the night and I was in the rainforest of Australia and it frustrated me that I could never find the insects that were biting the leaves. And I climbed trees every day and never saw one gosh darn insect. And when I went out to the outhouse in the middle of the night, I heard this amazing sound of munching overhead. And it turns out that most of the insects ate at night to avoid being eaten by birds. It makes great logical sense. And so then I had to start climbing at night to find all the bugs. And that helped me discover all these amazing millions of critters that ate insects, which was really fun. Um, and the other thing that was amazing is that some trees in the drier forests tolerated something like 300% defoliation, meaning insects ate one whole flush and another whole flush and another, and you know that just eventually killed the trees. But most trees tolerated something like 25% defoliation a year, which was much higher than what foresters had predicted with their ground level observations. So by being in the tree, it gave us a whole lot more intimate knowledge about the health of these trees, which was pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. And a lot of love for bugs. I will say one story, and you're in it. I actually have it here, but this beetle, uh, whenever I would see a characteristic kind of eating on a leaf, I would say, I got to find the bug. And this is that new beetle from the Amazon that you and DC Randall spent hours in the dark at 105 feet on a platform in the canopy waiting for this beetle to appear. And when it did, do you remember, James? You dropped it. <laughs> you grabbed it and dropped it. And I heard you scream because I was on <laughs> another platform. And then two weeks later, you found another one. <laughs> yep. But yep. those are the kind of trials and tribulations of field trials. You have to catch those little guys, right? Um, you little bug, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, yeah, that was an exciting, exciting find for sure. It was that that new beetle species um, uh, when it finally got pinned down eventually after you know, one or two, I think, went over the edge before we finally, <laughs> finally got one. Um, but we did get one, which is good. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, what about, did you ever, uh, did you ever find any, you know, anything, I guess, particularly concerning or scary, you know, I think up in the middle of the night in the rainforest, you could, you could at least imagine some scary stuff. I don't know if you ever saw anything that, that, uh, that made you nervous while you were, while yeah, you were it there. Mostly drunk Australians trying to get home from the pub that were wanting <laughs> past my tent. <laughs> Um, but as scary. far as wildlife, I'm sure you meant natural history. You know, there are a lot of toxic things in the rainforest as well as everywhere else. There were giant stinging trees, which I studied. And of course, Australia had 95% of its snakes totally venomous. But for the most part, you know, it's a fairly wonderful environment because most of those organisms stay away from you. And as long as you know a little bit about them, the same way you need to know poison ivy or nettles, if you live up in the Northeast of the US, um, you just have to come to get to know things. Um, but there are always risks in every field. And uh, maybe, you know, it just was part of the 
lay of the land to learn a few things. Um, I did help other researchers. I helped some of my fellow graduate students with activities. And one of the scariest ones might have been sea snake research, going up on boats and measuring sea snake biology. And of course, they're totally venomous. And that was pretty, I, I loved experiencing it, but I have a great respect from a big distance for things like venomous snakes. And I'll let someone else study them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you, you've, you know, had in, in some ways two, you know, two maybe more careers, you know, both as an academic ecologist, but also as a public advocate and communicator, um, you know, I think advocating for, um, you know, uh, scientific programs, at, you know, whether it's at a museum or at a county or state or national level. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm curious, you know, at the end of the day, which of those, you know, fields is more, more daunting and, you know, the, the academic, uh, you know, ecology environment or the, um, the, you know, the community, you know, education and policy level, because you've been, you've been involved in all of them. Maybe some of the scariest things you've encountered are, are not even in the rainforest, but I'm, you know, I'd love to hear Probably your true. perspectives on those different, uh, those different environments. Yeah, I did start out as a professor at Williams College, of course, and then get recruited to come down to Selby Gardens in Sarasota. And I must say, I loved the museum world, botanical gardens and museums being places where public people come in and need to be educated because it gives you a chance to address a huge age range. I always call it from K through gray, meaning from kindergarten to senior citizens. And, I think that's a really big challenge. On the other hand, teaching as a professor was great because you get to train the next generation like Lila will soon be. I can hear her talking to me right now. <laughs> and um, you know, that's great too. But I, I did love the museum world because right now we're in this big kind of hub for science in, in specifically citizen science it's called where we try to get the public engaged in science. And when I was here in Florida for so many years, I was very privileged to be a climate change advisor for Alex Sink when she was the CFO with Charlie Christus, the governor. And, you know, that was at a time when nobody used that word climate change, but we were modeling sea level rise in Miami and around the coast. And those things were pretty tough to do, but it was a challenge to try to talk to politicians about that and make it simple and clear. And I think the, you know, the public science or the museum world really helped me to hone my communication skills in a sense. So I value that a lot and it probably helped me write the book too. Yeah, no, that's great. I, I'm i always amazed at all the different communities that you've really engaged with from, you know, Coptic Christians in Ethiopia to, you know, the state of Florida to, you know, uh, ecologists in, in uh, you know, in Malaysia and everywhere in between. Um, well, only for the trees. Otherwise, <laughs> it might stay home and eat Oreos. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, well, you know, maybe, and I'm going to, you know, wrap up some of my questions here, I think, um, it, you know, and, and open it up to the, to the floor in just a minute. But I guess maybe you can tell us a little bit about, you know, what, what you see ahead um, for you. I mean, what's, you know, um, what's next in, um, uh, for, for Canopy Meg? Um, and, uh, uh, you know, and, and I guess also what's, um, you know, what's your, uh, in particular, I think, you know, message to, to everyone on, on, the, on the line here. I think um, there's, um, you know, I think in the book, and I was lucky to be able to read a lot of it before it came out, but I, you, you, you close and give, I think, a lot of um, uh, reasons for people to be hopeful and, you know, look forward to, you know, uh, having a, an impact in conservation and, in, you know, the environment, even though there's a lot of challenges that we're all familiar with. So I guess would love to hear your, your view on kind of what's next for yourself. And then also, you know, if, is, the, is there a message that we can kind of give to everyone that comes through in the book around, you know, how to feel about the future of um, ecology and, and the environment? Well, you want the two minute answer, or the two hour answer? Oh, just <laughs> kidding. That's a big question. You got all night. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so at a personal level, uh, my bucket list for retirement was two things, write a book 
and learn to play golf. And I'm happy to say in Sarasota, I am learning to play golf. <laughs> and I just wrote a book. So that's good. I guess my I could terminate tomorrow and it would be all okay. But professionally, I have uh, ended the book with a chapter about my newest and hopefully last big program, which is called Mission Green. And that's based on my friend Sylvia Earle, who's an oceanographer's program called Mission Blue, where she brings attention to hope spots in the ocean that need saving. And I'm similarly using her model to bring attention to forest spots, which I call hot spots, meaning areas of high biodiversity and very endangered forests. So uh, in the next 10 years, I really hope we can build canopy walkways like the one at my Acker River State Park in different areas of forest that are highly endangered with high biodiversity, because if we could create ecotourism and provide income to local people, they'll be a lot less tempted to be part of logging teams and in industries that are very, you know, kind of one way tickets because it doesn't provide a sustainable income. And if we can set up these ecotourism operations by building these canopy walkways, we can not only provide uh, environmental justice for a lot of women and families to be hired, but we can also create scholarships from great colleges like New College or Williams or Harvard to send students to discover all this biodiversity before it's too late. So Mission Green is the end of the book. It comes with a little list of 10 things everyone can do. And I will just end by saying one of the most important things is don't just rely on planting new trees. You know, when you think about those terrible fires in Australia, koalas can't live on seedlings. They need mature forests to provide a habitat. So we really need to save big trees. And Florida is a particular example where that's so important. It's just not good enough to cut down a big tree and then plant 10 little trees. We've got to prioritize how we can strategically save big trees and adjust real estate and adjust roads and other things to keep this amazing gold, you, you know, ecological gold, which I call big trees, intact and healthy. And so I hope that everybody can join forces with that. With the new IPCC report that just came out yesterday, it's very dire and there's a lot of warming and a lot of bad prognoses for the uh, you know entire globe. But the one great thing about trees is they absorb carbon dioxide, they shade, they provide foods and medicines as sustainable products. So they're one of the best ways to ameliorate climate change and not cost trillions and zillions of dollars. So if we get smart and save big trees, it might help our kids as a great inheritance, maybe better than any other thing. So I'll leave it at that, but maybe people can read that last chapter of the book and find out what the other nine things are as far as how you can help save the planet and save forests. So thanks for asking, James. I think it's a, it's a great, a great message and a great, you know, tangible thing that we can all focus on. And I think, you know, we can, uh, we'll be focusing on finding some good big trees to save for, uh, for Lila and, and hopefully everyone else can um, you know, get involved and, and help protect other, uh, you know, mature trees and, and ecosystems around them, because I, I think I, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I guess, you know, I think in a, in a minute, we'll, we'll kind of, again, open it up to the floor, but any, um, any kind of last comments, you know, topic questions I didn't answer, I, I'm still, you know, saving the, the, the question of, you know, favorite child um, or favorite grandchild, but we'll, uh, we'll hold that one out. Um, but any there other- There are only two of you, Eddie, James. I hope I, Eddie's out there. About I, to... I know, exactly. And I, you know, so he's I think, on West yeah. Coast time, so he's yeah, yeah, one exactly. out. <laughs> got an excuse, uh, this, this go around, so. Um, Here she comes. Here's my little grand. I have one grandson and one granddaughter, so I'm lucky yeah. that I have a favorite of each gender. <laughs> this, is, this is your favorite granddaughter. Here she <laughs> is. Hello, dearie. <laughs> You're uh, the next generation. I hope you'll climb a tree pretty soon. <laughs> She, she must um, yeah. So maybe we have to turn it back to our host. Is yeah. she going to do the questions? Here I what? here I am. Oh goody. Okay. Oh, Thank there you. she is. Great. Here I am. Thank you. That that has been wonderful. I'm loving the discussion about uh your children with you in the in the rainforest. Really kind of really interesting. Uh I want to ask you about specifically about the canopy walkway in 
in my, <clears throat> excuse me, in my in Mayaka Park. Uh, for those of us who live in Florida, which I think a lot of us on this call do, could you talk a little bit about that and your role in that and the purpose of it and in all of that? Sure, love to. And of course, um, when I built the helped build the first canopy walkway in the world, it was in Australia. And then I came back to Williams College as a visiting professor and built a small one on the college forest uh, site. Um, when I came to Florida, it came to pass that people said, holy cow, you know, you're a canopy expert and we need a walkway here. And it was, I give a lot of credit to Mike Pender and Bob Richardson and the Downtown Association, all fundraising and creating uh, this kind of action plan where we created an opportunity to build a walkway and Mayaka was the site. That's the first public canopy walkway in North America, even though it's not huge and it doesn't go up hundreds of feet high, it gets to the top of the Florida treetops and it has a beautiful tower where kids can see the landscape of Florida, which is fabulous. Kids growing up in a flat state need to get up high once in a while. And so we're really excited that that walkway has been a boon to the park. Um, about a half a million visitors a year. And I guess in economic development terms, that relates to about, you know, 28 to $30 million a year contributed to the local economy. And it has been a great source of science for all the local school field trips. And when I was a professor at New College, we used to do science teacher field trips. And uh, we actually got a grant from the Community Foundation to take teachers out there to learn about sci you know, forest science and canopy science. So over the years, it's been a great chance for people to learn something new and um, see the Florida forests, even though you might not think your forests are as sexy as the Amazon, you know, those oak trees and palm trees have a whole lot of cool things living in them. And it's a really lovely point of view. So I hope everyone who is in Florida might get out there and enjoy it. Yeah, we just had a question uh, come in. Uh, <clears throat> over, I'm just going to read it on the chat. Over the years, have you seen a significant drop in biodiversity given our changing climate? And if yes, how do you talk about the dire consequences without bumming folks out? In other words, how do you empower people to make, to make or take action rather than feel the daunting challenges and feel hopeless? Yes, and the answer is absolutely yes. There's been a decrease in all kinds of biodiversity at different sites where forests have either been burned or shrunk or um, you know, cleared so that there are just patches left. And obviously a lot of wildlife can't survive without larger tracts of forest. So it's a huge problem and a huge concern. And yes, I do hundreds of school talks a year and it's always daunting to try to leave kids with a positive message. You just simply can't tell them the end is in sight, even though as a scientist, I'm very worried about that. So hence projects like Mission Green or giving kids projects where they can contribute, like trying to buy, help their parents buy shade grown coffee or trying not to buy soy or beef that's coming from the Amazon are ways that kids can tr contribute. Planting trees is still a great thing in schoolyards for the next generation. And I think it's always important as a scientist to try to make sure that kids don't have a dreadfully negative message because that would just be so counterproductive. In reading books, you know, they can go out and read some good books. And for high school kids, I hope the Arbornaut will give them some sense that there's still hope. Well, speaking of, of feeling hopeless in a way, do you see any, any hope uh, among any government agencies or, or any politicians or anything going on out there that, who, where, we're, where you might be seeing good leadership on this that maybe some of us can support and get behind? Oh, that's a great question. You know, it's really tough because it's touch and go. And of course, my view is very global. There's fantastic leadership in places like Bhutan and some good leadership in places like Malaysia. When I come back home and put a lens on, I think, you know, as always, we've had some charismatic leaders that really understand ecology, to be honest. I think most business people and politicians never had a biology class. And I've been trying to prioritize talking to 
business schools or alumni programs from business schools because um, it comes to pass that they don't know what a tree does for them and they never got taught that. So without that knowledge, how can they be really objective politicians and make sure that they're looking after the heritage of their children and grandchildren? So we do have an education problem, I think. And how can we jumpstart that process and get people in leadership that have had enough science and enough background in even if you're a duck hunter you probably understand the value of a wetland it doesn't mean you have to have a phd in biology to maybe understand the value of ecosystems but i think we need to be looking for leaders that have a real sense of nature and maybe have had some experiences along the way that give them an understanding about the value of ecosystems. And right now with climate change, it's pretty obvious we don't have a lot of that. I'll be very blunt to say, oh my gosh, you know, we need to turn this around pretty quickly for our kids. And that's kind of scary. Yeah, yeah, it really is. I, I, I'm going to just very briefly um, see if I can was going to un see if I could unmute some people if they somebody might want to ask one last question, but let's see if I can get that done. I want to unmute people. Okay, ask. So are there just, we would have time for just a couple of more questions. So since we're not getting a lot of them through the chat, I'm wondering if there are any of you out there who would just like to unmute yourselves and just I, I can't see all of you on the screen, but I'm seeing, but I am seeing a chat question come through. And um, it's, can you speak to the importance of natural forest management, especially in the tropics, as a means to both protect natural forest and species, as well as provide a livelihood to those who might otherwise clear cut. And by the way, I too carried my young son around during my work at the Tropical Science Center's Monteverde Cloud Forest Preserve back in the 1990s. I hope you remember me from the Friends of Monteverde days as from Pamela oh. Gormead. Oh, nice. Thank you for asking that. And, you know, I hope and pray that Mission Green will address those issues of getting local people involved because without trust in local community effort conservation is really not possible in the tropics and tropical forest management is so different from temperate forests and I think that's been an issue for a lot of international groups to grapple with because you know we have great soils up in Massachusetts if you cut a forest down you have those glacial soils and trees can grow back pretty quickly but if you clear things in the tropics we're looking at a thousand years, maybe more, to bring back all those orchid bees, to pollinate the orchids, or bring back all that high diversity of species. And where will the seed source come from? So tropical forest management is a huge challenge to bring back native forests. You could try to plant a monoculture of one plantation, but you probably won't have too much success because those soils are not rich and there's a lot of challenges now with enough rainfall if you clear the areas. So suffice it to say, it's a hugely complex issue and we haven't done a very good job as human beings to manage tropical forests. We, The best thing we could do is leave them alone, but we need to find you know, economic uh, jobs and opportunities for the local people. And that's where perhaps ecotourism could come in, bird watching, fishing, you know, nature trails and things like that, I hope could be an answer for the local people in the tropics. So stay tuned. Right. I see, it looks like Cynthia Denny, she has, she has a hand up. So Cynthia, if you have a question, would you unmute yourself and go ahead and ask it? Cynthia, do you have a question? I see the hand up uh, symbol. Maybe which she's is frozen. No, I don't think she's frozen. Yeah. But okay, anyone else with a? Um, oh, here it is, from from Cynthia to to me, to everyone. Um, I'm not sure what you mean, Cynthia. You say until me. So if you, you might can, have missed the text, eh? Uh, no, no, no. Well, there, Cynthia, are you unmuted now? I, 
Hello? I see I see her trying to I see her trying to talk. Oh yeah, James says she might mean unmute me instead of okay. until me. Oh, I see. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Okay. All right. And is it me now? There you are, yes. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, I love the whole program. I did catch the very beginning, but I'm so appreciative of you sponsoring this and for our uh, for the guest speaker. So, um, so my background is I was involved with the Arbor Day Free City USA program as as a stay at home mom at the time. I found a way to save the trees and you know in my community. And so uh, we really learned the importance of the urban forest. And uh, mm -hmm. I know that the, our big major forests are critically important, but I want to emphasize how the urban forest is maybe not equally, but close to being important and how you see that playing into the whole process, the whole ecological system and how we can be more um, better stewards there. Well, I certainly agree with you so much. You know, yeah, we need to work on urban forests and forests near people, not forests far away from people. I was on the um, urban forest council for the city of San Francisco for the last five years when I worked out there and talk about a hot spot, but they gave trees more status than humans sometimes, which was kind of amazing and wonderful. Um, we have a lot to learn. I think, you know, I, I worry in Sarasota that we're falling backwards a little bit. We need to really prioritize the value of big trees and work with people. We don't want to have, you know, total failures of progress, whatever that means, but we certainly need to understand what urban trees do for us and what trees in yards and trees in neighborhoods and parks do for us. And I think, again, that education process with politicians and leadership is probably really lacking. I don't think people purposefully say, you know, I'd like to cut these trees down so my grandchildren will have no life. I think they just don't really understand why they should be thinking harder about the choices they're making. So if we can possibly fix that, it would be great. Yeah. Workshops for politicians. Let's bring it up. More tree shows. <laughs> okay. Are there any other questions from anyone before we call it a night? We're about out of time. I see Kevin, uh, Kevin, Kevin Kindlin. Or no, that's Elizabeth. Elizabeth Demanio. Let's see. I just want to see. Hi, Meg. How are you? Um, this has been wonderful. I wonder if you could speak about the the wildflowers, the forests that are burning oh. out west. And what is the prognosis? Is there any hope? What's going to happen with climate change, especially sure. the new report? It seems rather dire. Do you have some thoughts you yeah. can share on that? Thanks, Betsy, for asking. You know, last year, of course, we saw the Amazon burn, Siberia burn, Australia burn, uh, you know, places in the Mediterranean burn, California burn. Uh, I mean, it's been an absolute disaster. And part of that's because of climate change warming the planet, having more extreme dry spells, rainfall patterns falling into disarray. Um, and all of a sudden we see burning in California in particular, one of the problems historically was that a lot of people planted eucalypts from Australia, gum trees they're called, which actually have volatile oils in their sap because they need fire to reproduce. In Australia, fire is part of the natural system. Those wildflower fires in Australia in the outback never touched a human soul, but they helped those eucalyptus germinate every couple of years. And so that was part of the natural ecosystem. That's why those trees evolved with these volatile oils, which encourage fire. So planting a eucalypt next to your house in California is kind of like putting a pile of oily rags in your attic and hoping <laughs> and praying that nothing will happen. So we humans have brought it on in two ways, climate change and planting a species that's very, very volatile and burns so quickly. And it's tragic because it also is now burning the native species. When the fires get hot enough, they don't just stop with the, the gum trees. And so, yeah, we're in big, big trouble. And the only way to turn that around is to, you know, 
cool the planet and stop doing some of these things that release carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And it's going to take a while, but it's probably the scariest thing going on right now. And I'm really sorry that I can't give you an overnight solution, but planting native species in places where they need to be is usually the best thing to do because most native species in California or Florida or anywhere else are not fire prone. Australia is a very unique place with fire ecology as part of its absolute required history. And um, you just don't want to plant those trees near your house. And you make sure you don't have a eucalypt over there on Siesta Key, Betsy. <laughs> no, not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I thank you, Meg. Thank you, James. This has been a delightful session. And I really appreciate all of you who have attended tonight. And once again, a special thank you to our partners at Books and Books in Miami, who have joined us yeah. for this presentation. So good night to all. Thank you again. Thank you.